Hello, I'm Dick Bishop. I was the president of the Alaska chapter of the Wildlife Society in 1978 and maybe part of 1979. When Tom Paragai asked me to take part in this panel, I said I would rather not because as president, I had done nothing for the chapter. And it was a painful and lasting memory that is an embarrassment. Tom persisted. He suggested that I could talk about what was going on in Alaska wildlife management from my perspective in the 1970s in Alaska. I said, okay. In recalling those years, though, I realized that my immersion in the state efforts on ANILCA eclipsed almost all else except wolf control in the 1970s and through December 1980 when ANILCA passed. I'll go back a bit before 1970 to talk about the Alaska Conservation Society, or ACS which began in 1960 as a result of nuclear fission, not internally, but Project Char Chariots planned nuclear blast to create a deep water harbor at Point Cape Thompson near Point Hope in Northwest Alaska. A handful of concerned conservationists and scientists in or around the Fairbanks University started ACS. Among others were Jenny Hill Wood, Celia Hunter, Fred Dean, Bill Pruitt, Les and Terry Verick, Bob Whedon, and a little later, Dave Klein. More biologists, geologists, and the general public soon joined the Alaska Conservation Society. Project Chariot failed when the potential ecological harm became apparent through review by ACS members and others. The Firecracker Boys, a book by Dan O'Neill, tells the story very well. ACS going forward provided a forum for science-based review of resource issues around the state, such as Rampart Den, the Trans-Alaska Pipeline System, Tongass National Forest, and uh, many lesser issues. As an active ACS member, board member, and interim president for a few months, I gained some insights about the politics of ANILCA. On one occasion, Wyatt Gilbert and I of ACS met with representatives of the Audubon Society and the Wilderness Society to talk about ACS joining the National Environmental Group's Alaska Coalition lobbying effort on ANILCA. When Wyatt and I explained ACS's objection to classifying important hunting areas by inclusion in national parks, we were angrily told, quote, if ACS insists on allowing hunting on areas proposed for parks, that's where discussion between ACS and the Alaska Coalition ends. The Alaska Coalition had no grassroots mem uh, Alaskan member organization and badly wanted the ACS as a member group. The ACS leadership at that time, a little later than when I was there in that position, with, uh, struggled with the decision and ultimately joined the coalition, hoping to have some influence on the coalition positions, but ACS views were largely ignored. Yet ACS was publicly and proudly portrayed as part of the coalition. According to Bob Whedon, ACS disbanded as a statewide group in 1980, when he was again president. The nine chapters each preferred to go, go their own way. To this day, I believe that the brief alliance of ACS with the Alaska Coalition contributed to the end of ACS by undermining its Alaskan credibility. ACS's dissolution was a serious loss for conservation in Alaska. I think of ACS as sort of a forerunner of the Alaska chapter of TWS. Well, I mentioned the Roaring Seventies. Picture the challenge in 1960 of organizing a brand new state, including a fish and game department responsible for conserving and managing almost all of Alaska's amazingly diverse fish and wildlife. 
Then consider the challenge just 10 years later of dealing with the legal ash fallout of about 15 major federal laws affecting resource management as the nation's environmental conscience awoke. Here's a sample of just five. Federal Airborne Hunting Act of 90, 1971. It was prompted by protests of shooting wolves from the air in Alaska. The law prohibited shooting wildlife from the air except under a state permit, but it also opened new legal ways to challenge wolf control in Alaska. Thus began years of lawsuits, ballot initiatives, and public controversy in state and nationally. Another law was the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act of or uh, Alaska, Name, <laughs> Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, or ANCSA, 1971. ANCSA changed the land ownership pattern dramatically in Alaska, affected land access rules, and required action, which resulted in the 1980 ANILCA legislation. A third one was Marine Mammal Protection Act of 1972, or MMPA. It was passed in protest to seal killing in the eastern Canada seaboard. This law prohibited most public hunting of marine mammals in Alaska. Alaska's management programs for seals, sea lions, sea otters, polar bear, and walrus became impossible under federal rules, and the state rejected further involvement, but did continue contract research. The, MMM, the MMPA also discriminated racially by allowing only Alaska natives from designated coastal areas to hunt marine mammals. Under this law, Cook and Let Beluga may be approaching extinction as a result of unregulated commercial harvest. Those beluga near Kotzebue are similarly at risk from unregulated personal and possibly commercial harvest. The meat can be sold from belugas. The Endangered Species Act of 1973 has, has uh, created challenges. It, the law does not seem to adequately consider state in, input or concerns and decisions on listing species or designating critical habitat. Recent examples of difficulty with that law include the reintroduction of wood bison in Alaska and the current controversy over uh, critical habitat uh, designation for seals in the Bering Sea. And finally is in Anilka, which, which is the Alaska National Interest Lands Conservation Act of 1980 which set up a separate system of regulation for taking fish and game on federal lands, and it has a really complicated management. The rural residents, the requirement for priority subsistence use is inconsistent with Alaska's constitution. The provisions for state federal cooperation on resource management have been neglected, ignored, and and or abused by federal agencies. A draft annotated list of these gaps called erosion has been compiled by Tina and is available by contacting an specialist at gmail.com. ADF and G learned quite a bit in, in the 60s and 70s about creation and prayer. In the 1960s and early was widely accepted among wildlife biologists in the field and in academia. That's what I was taught in college, and I believed it for a while. In the late 60s, as I reviewed moose survival data and reports of wolf abundance, I began to question that premise. Some biologists in the new fishing game also believed it. They camped, campaigned hard at statehood and beyond for years to remove bounties, reclassify wolves as big game and fur bears, and not pursue aerial wolf control. Wayne Reglan's book, Fish Wars, Fish Politics and Wolf Wars, uh, 
noted that ADF and G Commissioner Jim Brooks chose to cease issuing aerial wolf shooting permits in 1972. But the growing information showing low and declining moose numbers in spite of restricted hunting and increased numbers of wolves in game management in the 28 convinced Fish and Game to propose aerial wolf control in 1975 in that area. The Board of Game approved the proposal. The shift in management strategy reflected an improved understanding of wolf population dynamics. ADF and G was, of course, sued on the premise that an EIS was required on federal lands, but a federal court said it was not required. The comprehensive research of Bill Gasway during the 70s and into the early 80s was published as the well as Society Monograph number 84. Gasway verified the importance of wolf predation in limiting moose and caribou populations, along with other factors. As time passed, the objective evaluation of predation's role in prey population dynamics has encroached long-standing fads and myths. Controversy over the uh, subsistence issue showed up in state law as well. In the early 1970s, a ticket for sharing or bartering of some fish touched off protests against state law or regulation that constrained common practices in the uses of fish and game widely and loosely called subsistence. The controversy reached the state legislature in 1978, which passed a law saying subsistence uses of fish and game as defined in the law had priority over the other uses. The law did not include a rural or other specific priority. The definition from state law was soon added to ANILCA along with to a rural priority. The state law was later amended to include a rural priority in ILCA. Ultimately, it was declared unconstitutional, unconstitutional by the Alaska Supreme Court in the 1989 McDowell case. Along the way, the Joint Boards of Fish and Game had been handed the hot potato of reconciling state and federal subsistence priorities. I saw them sweat blood over it, but, it, but they failed. No fault of theirs. Wayne Redland details the battle in his book. In the end, Alaska has a subsistence priority available, available conditionally to all residents and a federal rural subsistence priority on federal lands and a mixed bag on state navigable waters. Hopefully, uh, John Stur Sturgeon's victory in the Supreme Court will help clear the air and the muddy water. Back to Anilka, which uh, Anilka may have a longer half-life than the uh, radioactive uh, elements that might have come from Project Chariot. But uh, a couple of years ago, when a young National Park Service intern asked me what got Anilka started, I said, an Ohio River caught fire. He looked at me blankly, as you might expect. But the national reaction to that spectacularly disastrous event and similar travesties in the lower 48 spurred environmentalists to seek dramatic redress of such calamities. But what to do and where? Enter an ANILCA, a mandate for putting huge areas in Alaska into federal conservation units. But was there a threat to Alaska's ecological integrity? Right on cue came the proposed 800 mile Trans Alaska Pipeline System, or TAPS, a crash program to get Alaska's oil into America's gas tanks. It was pretty easily portrayed as a portent of more of the same and politically timely in Washington, D.C. The Alaska Coalition of National Environmental Groups gathered to design and lobby for whole ecosystem protection. Federal agencies competed for more new territory for their agencies. Governor Hammond called on 
and sent, called on staff and sent us to work in DC to present information to members of Congress and media outlets there and elsewhere in the country uh, about Alaska's concerns. I was assigned to the handful of ADF and J staff for the job. I uh, soon realized that as a country hick in the midst of semi sophisticated but chaotic, chaotic process about which I knew little, but I did develop some strong impressions. Number one, most legislators in Congress were more concerned with their political images than with Alaska's real or made up environmental concerns. Number two, the state of Alaska's concerns were a nuisance. Even Governor Hammond got a, only a politely cold reception most of the time. Number three, the Alaska coalition had no respect for truth in advertising. Number four, were it not for the Alaska Federation of Natives strong lobby for consumptive uses, including hunting and fishing and trapping, Alaskan opportunities probably would have been diminished even more than they were. Finally, the provisions made for states' rights and individual property rights were hard-won concessions. And that concludes my remark. Anilka became law on December 2nd, 1980. It remains controversial. The Sturgeon case in the U.S. Supreme Court is a prime example. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. I'm John Shane, and it's great to be here today celebrating our 50th anniversary of the Alaska chapter of the Wildlife Society. I joined the Wildlife Society back when I was a graduate student at the University of Washington nearly 50 years ago. And I served as chapter president uh, during 1986. So I'm representing the, the decade of the 80s. Our record of chapter leadership is a bit sketchy during the 70s and early 80s. State biologists seemed to predominate during the earlier years uh, of the 70s and the 80s. And uh, then we had more balance with federal, state, and university leadership. Ellen Campbell was the first woman to serve as chapter president during 1996 and 97. And we're delighted to have Kim as our current chapter president. I believe an important goal uh, for the chapter is to increase diversity of our membership. I'm going to begin with a review of key portions of our current mission and selected goals and objectives. The chapter mission includes to benefit the long-term health of Alaska's wildlife and the sustained use and enjoyment of these resources by the public. The Alaska chapter serves as an objective science-based organization that provides information and thoughtful analysis on conservation of wildlife and their habitats. From our goals and objectives, goal two, increase public awareness and appreciation of wildlife conservation and the wildlife profession. Seek opportunities to present information on wildlife science and management and policy to the public. Goal three, advocate use of sound biological, social and economic information for wildlife policy decisions and provide technical information, advice and professional opinions on major Alaskan wildlife resource issues. So, uh, my objective now is to provide a brief summary of some of the key policy issues of the Alaska chapter uh, during, uh, from 1979 through 89. Our sketchy record uh, of the past indicates that Bob Whedon drafted a position statement on the Arctic refuge in 87, and it was formalized in 93. But during the 80s, it appears that nearly all of the policy activities focused on the Tongass National Forest. And I'm going to provide a brief review of some of the key points of the Tongass so that people can understand uh, what we were dealing with. One of the key issues is that the left photo is of second growth that's 50 years old 
And the right photo is old growth. It's centuries old. And the contrast between these two uh, forest successions is really significant and has great implications for wildlife. If you clear cut an old growth forest and cut it again in a hundred years, the old growth ecosystem is really non-renewable. Now, another key issue is that only half of the Tongass is actually forested. You know, much of it is rock and ice and muskeg and alpine, only, but then only 3% of the Tongass has large tree old growth. So many people think of the Tongass as this vast forest, but in reality, uh, the large tree old growth, which has been the focus of the timber harvest over the last 70 years, is a very, very small portion of the old growth in the Tongass, and yet it's very important fish and wildlife habitat. So in 1979, the Alaska chapter uh, developed the first position statement on forest practices in Alaska. And I'm going to hit a couple of the high points. There appears to be a conflict between maintaining wildlife habitat and current timber harvest levels in Southeast Alaska. Under existing management, the climax forests of Southeast Alaska are a non-renewable resource. The most significant recommendation that was made back in 1979, and this is uh, continued uh, up to the current day, was stop high grading the high volume old growth. It's a very rare portion of the forest that's high value to fish and wildlife. And over the last 70 years, the timber industry has focused harvest on this important habitat type. Now in 1982, the Northwest section of the Wildlife Society held their annual meeting in Juneau uh, in concert with a symposium uh, on fish and wildlife relationships in old growth forest. And this was co-sponsored by the American Institute of Fisheries Research Biologists and uh, a proceedings of this symposium came out of that conference. A proceedings that was over a 400 page long and can, uh, considered uh, the relationships of both fish and wildlife to forest management in Southeast Alaska. Now, in concert with that uh, Northwest section meeting, uh, the Northwest section passed two resolutions. One was on wildlife research in old growth forests of the Pacific Northwest. And the key was to fund research in the US and Canada and curtail harvest of old growth while research was conducted. The second resolution uh, considered coastal forest management. Uh, and this was in British Columbia and Alaska primarily. And it was a recognition that old growth beach fringe has unique value to wildlife and forest management should retain its old growth character. So in 1985, uh, the Alaska chapter revised our position statement on old growth forest management in coastal Alaska. And uh, the key points included old growth is rare and old growth provides important fish and wildlife habitat. High grading, high volume old growth should cease. High value fish and wildlife habitat should be protected. Display the cumulative effects of forest management on fish and wildlife and assess effects of roads on fish and wildlife. In May of 1986, the US House held hearings on the Tongass National Forest. I was invited to testify as a state research scientist at a congressional hearing on the Tongass. The state of Alaska said I was unavailable and that there was no uh, funding uh, for me to travel to DC. Well, uh, that was not entirely accurate. Uh, after consultation with my wife and my Alaska Fish and Game collaborators, I decided to travel to DC and testify on behalf of the Alaska chapter of the Wildlife Society. 
during which time I was serving as chapter president. The Wildlife Society field director, Tom Franklin, also provided supporting testimony and uh, endorsed the chapter's position statement. The next day, following my testimony, uh, Chief Max P Peterson testified. His key points included, we intend to include in perpetuity a viable population of black-tailed deer on the Tongass. And we are affecting less than one-tenth of 1% 1 of the Tongass forest annually. And we are affecting only a small portion of old growth. Well, there was no discussion of high grading, you know, targeting harvest in the highest value old growth sites that are very important deer habitat. Um, and uh, these simple percentages that he provided can be very misleading. In follow up questions, Chairman Cyberling remarked that the slides that I showed the previous day told a compelling story about the impacts of clear cutting on black tailed deer. One of the take home messages that I think many of us got is that uh, when you're trying to describe a situation like dealing with old growth forest, a picture is clearly worth a thousand words. So also in 1986, the Alaska chapter produced a 22 minute automated slide program, wildlife and the old growth forest in Southeast Alaska. Uh, this program was shown around the US in conjunction with, with hearings and discussions about uh, management of the Tongass National Forest. In 1987, the Alaska chapter was represented on a Wildlife Society Old Growth Technical Committee. The committee's findings, management and conservation of old growth in the United States, um, was published in the Wildlife Society Bulletin in 1988. The lead author was Jack Ward Thomas, who, by the way, became a future chief of the US Forest Service. He was senior author. Key points included, only two to 15% of virgin forests remain in the US today. Replacement stands of old growth cannot be created by silviculture. Numerous wildlife species use old growth disproportionate to its occurrence and old growth may provide critical habitat for some species. We believe federal stat statutes mandate the preservation of old growth as parts of the managed forest. And we should consider the concept of a threatened or endangered ecosystem. So in May of 1987, there were additional hearings on the Tongass National Forest back in DC. Matt Kirchhoff, who was a wildlife scientist with the Department of Fish and Game, also traveled back to DC and gave testimony at those hearings on behalf of the Alaska chapter. And Tom Franklin provided him with significant support. In November of 1987, I again traveled to DC and represented the Wildlife Society uh, at US Senate hearings on the Tongass. And uh, this was a key conclusion of my testimony. The Wildlife Society believes that passage of, the, of SB 708, which was the Tongass Timber Reform Act, will help improve multiple use forest management on the Tongass by providing greater flexibility in where, how much, and what kinds of old growth timber are harvested. Now, I could never have made that statement as a representative of the state of Alaska, but the Wildlife Society provided the opportunity and, the, and current science was provided to the committee. The bottom line, uh, during the decades of the decade of the 80s, the Wildlife Society provided scientists the ability to take science beyond peer reviewed journals and provide policymakers an assessment of the wildlife trade offs associated with forest management. The Wildlife Society played an integral role in passage of the Tongass Timber Reform Act 
enhancing wildlife conservation on our nation's largest national forest. So that's a summary of the 80s decade and the relationship that the Alaska chapter of the Wildlife Society played in uh, forest and, and wildlife policy in Alaska. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Ellen Campbell, and I was president of the Alaska chapter in 1996 and 97. In a fit of decluttering a few years ago, I cleaned out most of my files for the Alaska chapter and the Northwest section, but I still retained enough information about the multiple issues of the 90s, and I had access to the Alaska chapter archives, which showed six position statements and one policy statement issued in the 90s. It was a very busy decade. As an aside, I consider the Conservation Review Committee to be a vitally important portion of the chapter and the chairman's job perhaps more difficult than the president's. The chair of that committee during much of the 90s was Matt Kirchhoff. But many members were involved in important issues during that decade. And if I don't mention those issues, it's not to diminish their importance. I plan to discuss two issues in greater detail, touch on a couple others, have some closing comments, and my time will be up. First, I'll follow up on John's presentation. In 1990, Congress passed the Tongass Timber Reform Act. That repealed the mandate to offer 4.5 billion board feet of timber per decade and eliminated the significant funding support for that program. It also increased protection for riparian areas, uh, in, increased water quality, added more wilderness areas, and limited the harvest of high volume old growth timber. But the mills were, were still operating and timber being cut disproportionately targeting high quality, low elevation old growth. In 1992, the chapter appealed the record of decision for the Kelp Bay timber sale on Baranoff Island, which continued to target the high quality old growth timber. The appeal was denied. The chapter put together a coalition, including the Sierra Club Legal Defense Fund, the Wilderness Society, the Sierra Club itself, and with significant financial support from the Alaska Conservation Foundation, they filed suit against the implementation of that timber sale. This was all done with full support from the Wildlife Society headquarters. The chapter and its partners won the lawsuit and stopped the sale. This was a remarkable example of what a small group of like-minded individuals with a sound basis in science can accomplish. The process from basic science all the way to judicial action was clearly described in a 1995 Wildlife Society Bulletin article authored by John Shane, Matt Kirchhoff, and Tom Franklin, using Kelp Bay as the example. Meanwhile, additional forces were at work addressing Tongass management. In 1993, a Fish and Wildlife Service received a petition to list the Alexander Archipelago wolf under the Endangered Species Act. And in 1994, they received a petition to list the Queen Charlotte goshawk. A letter from the director of the Fish and Wildlife Service stated that, unless logging on the Tongass National Forest is substantially altered and reduced, the Fish and Wildlife Service will be compelled to list these two species. There was also concern about marble murrelet, sit black-tailed deer, marten, and, and additional species. In 1993, the Sitka Mill closed 
and in 1997, the Ketchikan mill closed, both for economic reasons because of the loss of the long-term contracts and because neither mill was able to meet current Clean Water Act or Clean Air Act standards without the addition of millions and millions of dollars. Meanwhile, the Forest Service was developing a new land management plan that greatly reduced the allowable harvest and included significant protection for uh, riparian resources and was made with a great deal of involvement of state biologists and Forest Service researchers at the Forest Sciences Lab in Juneau. In 1997, the new plan was approved by regional forester Bill Janik, who was a wildlife biologist by background. The whole decade was an era of upheaval for the thousands of people in Southeast Alaska involved in the mills, in forest management, with the Forest Service, and our agency partners. My second major topic is wolf management. Wolf management was of course, not exclusively a 90s issue. Prior to that decade, wolf management went through many phases, including bounties, aerial gunning, poisoning, no management control at all, and eventually land and shoot. Land and shoot had just recently been prohibited on federal lands, and I was happy to be personally on the sidelines of this issue, but it was distressing to watch ADF&G whipsawed by opposing viewpoints and direct political intervention. In 1991, the Board of Game adopted the Strategic Wolf Management Plan, which had been developed by 12 stakeholders and state employee, Wayne Reglin. In 1993, the Board of Game signed off on a revised plan that canceled any implementation of wolf control. And then they later approved wolf control in one area only at the direction of Governor Hickel, who was frustrated with the lack of action. In 1993, the legislature passed and the governor signed the intensive management law, which stated that the highest and best use of identified big game populations in most areas of the state is to provide for human consumption. About this time, Governor Hickel uttered one of his better known statements, you can't just let nature run wild. In 1996, the Alaska chapter issued a position statement regarding intensive management, which advocated a science-based approach, monitoring, a formal planning process with all stakeholders involved, and consideration of habitat manipulation among other recommendations. It also included a warning about potential long-term effects. In 1996, voters approved a ballot initiative to prohibit same-day airborne hunting of wolves. And in 1999, the legislature passed a bill approving same-day airborne hunting. The controversy and disagreements continued well into the next decade. I'll touch briefly on a few other issues of the 90s, which indiv individual biologists were deeply involved in, but not necessarily in all cases, the Alaska chapter. First, oil drilling in Anwar. The chapter issued a position statement in 1993 that listed concerns with drilling and also recommended, recommended mitigation measures which could be undertaken prior to or during any exploration. Some issues are never laid to rest. Second, subsistence management. In 1990, the federal government assumed management of game on federal lands. After many years and attempts to bring state and federal laws into agreement, it was a mess. Dual management was cumbersome 
divisive, onerous, frustrating, and of course, expensive. I want to close my discussion of issues of the 90s with briefly mentioning two wildlife issues that were actually a joy to be involved in. First was the Walkable Wildlife Program, a statewide interagency and NGO partnership. The efforts brought a proliferation of wildlife festivals throughout the state and the development of additional wildlife viewing sites. Both brought economic benefit to small communities. Additionally, the Alaska Wildlife Viewing Guide was published in 1996 in partnership with Defenders of Wildlife. Second, the development of Boreal Partners in Flight, another multi-agency effort led by USGS. With all partners concerned about the lack of knowledge on the status and trends of Alaskan land birds. This partnership led to increased inventory of bird populations, increased research, the dissemination of relevant information to land managers, and increased conservation efforts. In closing, we're all aware of the values of membership in the Wildlife Society at the state, regionally, and nationally the opportunity to share information on relevant issues, the ability to facilitate communications among biologists, the opportunities for professional development, the ability to develop and disseminate position statements on issues that a single biologist or single agency biologist could not touch, to be involved in a group with common interests, values, and goals, which is especially meaningful or biologists who work in multiple resource agencies, and the opportunity for networking and mutual support. I'd like to expand a bit on the mutual support. When I was finishing graduate school and looking for a full-time position, an interviewer with one state agency told me that I would not fit in with the rest of the crew. Therefore, there was no job for me. Another state game and fish agency asked me to send a photograph so that they could confirm that I was a female and tell them, and then they could tell me that they had no job that was suitable for my qualifications. It was my fellow graduate students and student chapter members who helped me feel valued, worthy, equal. That concept of equality and acceptance was present in each chapter I joined as my career took me around the country. Asked to run for a chapter office is gratifying, encouraging, confidence building. The Wildlife Society affords members the opportunity to be involved at multiple levels, from state to section to international, where I was honored to be elected the Northwest Section Rep to TWS Council. Ever, every position I held was a learning experience and valuable to me personally. And it gave me the opportunity to give back some of my time and talents to a profession I loved. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Eric Taylor with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and it's my honor and privilege to be speaking to the Alaska chapter of the Wildlife Society. I'd like to take a moment and acknowledge my panel members, John Shane, Ellen Campbell, and Dick Bishop for joining me with me today, and also Tom Paragai, who is the facilitator and the organizer of this conference. I have three things I wanna talk about this morning. One is the Alaska chapter being the president and during 2004 to 2006. Some professional experiences and some personal experiences, but most importantly, the accomplishments that the Alaska chapter did. The second thing, I did a detail with the Wildlife Society for two years during my tenure as Alaska president. I collaborated with Bruce Lauber from Cornell University to survey both the Fish and Wildlife Service and the USGS Wildlife and Fisheries Biologist to ask the question, are professional societies relevant to resource agencies. 
Finally, I'll close and talk a little bit about challenges and opportunities and perhaps jumpstart the discussion that we'll have after my talk. So a brief history. Why would a farm kid from Missouri want to be a wildlife biologist? Well, I grew up on a small farm with my grandparents and my mom and my sister, and I was blessed to be able to hunt and fish and learn my birds, which my grandmother knew immediately and passed on her knowledge to me. And then secondly, my mom bought a Ruger 1022 and a Mossberg 500C 20 gauge when I was 12. And I was able to enjoy the, the rabbits and the squirrels and the quails, harvest them and then bringing them home. And my grandmother taught me not only how to shoot a rifle or a shotgun, but she also taught me how to clean and dress anything I brought home from freshwater eel and catfish to uh, a fox squirrel, and most importantly, how to cook it in the morning. My mom also encouraged me to pursue whatever professional interest or hobby interest I had. So I knew I enjoyed the outdoors. I knew I enjoyed hunting and fishing and learning my birds. So I heard about this Explorer Scouts at the Missouri Department of Conservation. My mom drove me out there and I went and I met my first wildlife biologist with the Missouri Department of Conservation and a presentation. I said, that's the career for me. So I trekked off to University of Missouri and found out there was a wildlife management degree and started my education. Then I heard this thing about the Wildlife Society and I had no idea what it was until I got to wildlife management techniques, which was taught by Dr. Thomas Baskett, who was the unit leader for the Missouri Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit. And then I also took ornithology with Dr. William Elder and both of these mentors not only encouraged, but they pretty much mandated that wildlife students belong to a scientific society, and they pushed the wildlife society pretty hard. And so I joined way back in, I guess, around 1973 or 74. Years later, okay, many years later, I'm a refuge biologist sitting in the regional office, my phone rings, and it's my colleague and friend, Tom Paragot, who says, Eric, you should run for the Alaska chapter of the Wildlife Society president. And then Tom went on to say, you know, what characteristics and, and qualities I have that would be good for a president. He went on to say that, you know, I need to give back to the profession. And after the phone call, I said, okay, I, I will run. Well, unbeknownst to me, Tom had called several other people who had politely declined. And also unknown to me is there was no one running against me. And so, yes, it was a pretty much assured win to be the Alaska chapter president. Luckily, people felt kind enough to vote for me, so I wasn't totally embarrassed during the election. All right, so what happened during my tenure as the Alaska chapter president? I would say without a doubt and without a reservation, we influenced Alaska conservation. First, let's talk about the National Petroleum Reserve. In 2003, the Bureau of Land Management decided to look at the northeast section of the National Petroleum Reserve through the integrated activity plan and questioned whether the protections that were on that area were still warranted. The Alaska chapter immediately got engaged, formed a committee, and we started to attend meetings. We developed our scoping comments and we submitted over 30 pages of comments on the draft environmental impact statement as well as the final environmental impact statement. Most importantly, we collaborated with headquarters of the Wildlife Society with Thomas Franklin, who was policy director and actually acting executive director. Our comments were sent out by the Wildlife Society's headquarters and not the Alaska chapter. So they represented the entire Wildlife Society. Our position for the Alaska chapter and the Wildlife Society was the no action alternative. The unique and irreplaceable values of the Teshekpuk Lake area for molting geese as well as the Teshekpuk Lake caribou herd were irreplaceable. Our position was also shared by the Fish and Wildlife Service, by the North Slope Borough, by the Environmental Protection Agency, the Wildlife Management Institute, Audubon, Alaska, California Waterfowl Association, and others. Why? Because this area was extremely important to fish and wildlife resources. At the end of the day, the Bureau of Land Management leased 95% of the area, selecting their alternative and not the alternative that was put forward by the Alaska chapter 
in the Wildlife Society and other agencies. Some may consider that a loss. I don't, and I don't think the members that worked on it do either. Why? Because again, we documented the importance of this area to migratory birds, to molting geese, particularly black morant Canada geese and snow geese. It's important to the Shekbuck Lake caribou herd and subsistence users, and that stays on the record. So the next time this potential decision comes about, the Alaska chapter and the Wildlife Society has weighed in. Predator management, another topic, if you mention wildlife management, that instantly comes to the top. In 2004, at the annual meeting, several members brought up concerns about either current legislation or legislation about to be enacted affecting the conservation and management of black and brown bears, namely baiting of black bears and brown bears, intensive management or predator control, as well as the sale of bear parts of both black and brown bears. We ultimately founded a technical committee to look at a draft position paper. There was a lot of controversy associated with the draft position paper and we formed and ended up forming three technical committees to take each one of these topics on. At the end of the day, the technical reports are, represent the best available science, unbiased, without emotion, and something that the public, as well as agencies like the Fish and Wildlife Service and the Alaska Department of Fish and Game can use to make sound, defensible decisions in the future. A topic that came up with a very short window of reply was um, Senate Bill 85 in the legislature, which had to deal with removing the five mile corridor restrictions for off-road vehicles and snowmobiles. This came about and we had about a week to prepare comments and Tom Paraguay, you're gonna hear Tom's name come up over and over again in this talk, offered to write a letter um, opposing that removal of that restriction, primarily from habitat destruction and disturbance to fish and wildlife. Tom drafted a letter. He worked with the executive committee of the Alaska chapter. We went back and forth. We finalized the letter on Friday. We sent the letter to Tom Franklin, the policy director at headquarters. Tom came in on the weekend, put the letter on TWS letterhead, and sent it to every legislature in the Alaska legislature. They met on Monday and ultimately decided the bill would not move forward. That was a great example of a dedicated member, Tom Paraguay, and then working us, working closely with TWS headquarters and particularly Tom Franklin to get something out. The National Position Statement on Old Growth Forest, Matt Kirchhoff stepped up on this one. He formed an 11 member committee um, based from the United States and from Canada of management and research experts on old growth forest revised the statement for the Wildlife um, Society and put forward again, the best science and the most current knowledge to protect that unique ecosystem. Some things I didn't accomplish. One was reversing the membership decline. The Wildlife Society, as well as the Alaska chapter had incurred a significant decline in membership in the past decade when I was there. But I promised Tom, who then took over being the Alaska chapter president in 2006, I would work on a membership committee. And along with Jimmy Fox, who chaired it, Amy Kearns, Tom, and myself, we took on reversing that membership decline. We aggressively combined 12 lists of members, members with changed addresses or different emails and different phone numbers. We called people, we visited people, we mailed people, and not only did we look at former members and people that had um, used to be a member of the society, but for whatever reason dropped off, we looked at non-traditional members. So we contacted agency people, but we also contacted people in industry and conservation organizations and NGOs, again, distributing newsletters. Then we called the Wildlife Society and said, can you help us out? And they said, we will waive subscription fees to the journal as well as the Wildlife Society Bulletin. And not only that, as they provided some gifts. So between all of those efforts, we not only reversed the decline, we significantly increased membership. And um, just as a, as a side note, the Texas chapter has always had the greatest numbers of members. 
Alaska was always second. Well, in this particular case, Alaska took over with the top numbers of members um, of any chapter of the United States. And I might just add, it's always good when Alaska beats Texas in something. Not only that is the efforts that we put forward for the membership as well as the conference earned us the chapter of the year from the Wildlife Society, quite an honor considering all the chapters in the United States. Increasing support for the University of Alaska Fairbanks student chapter of the Wildlife Society, they too were experiencing declines and suffering. We stepped in, we offered speakers and attended their meetings. We offered to offer a position which they gladly accepted to sit on, to sit on the executive board of the Alaska chapter, a non-voting member. We also attended their annual wild game barbecue. Many of us did, and it suffice to say that people that are professionally employed make a little bit more money than the average wildlife student. And so you can imagine when they were bidding on arts or other types of uh, donations, it was the Alaska chapter members that were stepping up. In fact, the student chapter made $1,500 that, uh, on that particular event, which was the highest I think had been recently recorded. The 2006 National Wildlife Society Conference in Anchorage, Gino DeFrade and Howard Golden, two Alaska chapter members stepped up and with a whole cadre of others from the Alaska chapter of the Wildlife Society pulled off an outstanding meeting. And you can imagine workshops, sessions, field trips, birding trips, um, special sessions. Uh, it takes a lot of work. And Howard and Gino did an outstanding job, along with many others that put a significant amount of voluntary times. Building professional relationships. This is both, I think, a personal highlight for me as well as a professional. When you work with the Wildlife Society, you know, the professional organization, you work with everyone. I happen to have expertise in migratory bird ecology, but I dealt with people that were specialists in trapping and hunting and other aspects of fish and wildlife management. And those friendships that you form are endearing. It's always fun to see a person's name, to say that person served as the secretary or that person was the treasurer or in charge of the newsletters. Again, it's a highlight of being an Alaska chapter member. In 2003, David Anderson and others published a paper called Rigorous Science, Suggestions on How to Raise the Bar in the Wildlife Society Bulletin. That paper caused some waves because for one thing, it, it unequivocally stated that the lack of participation in scientific societies by wildlife biologists is debilitating and surely reflects a substantive problem in the profession. As I mentioned, the Wildlife Society was incurring a significant decline in membership, primarily in state and federal agencies. As a result, the Wildlife Society and the Fish and Wildlife Service formed an agreement that called for a detail, an intern, to be housed at the TWS headquarters in Bethesda, Maryland, to try to address this issue. I applied and was accepted for the position for the, for the period between 2005 and 2007. I was with the Wildlife Society in their Bethesda headquarters. I worked with Bruce Lauber from Cornell University and Bruce and I developed and implemented an electronic survey of both U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and USGS biologists to ask the question, are professional scientific societies relevant to today's resource agencies? Quick review of the methods. We did pre-survey interviews of both agencies to get an idea of the perceptions, the opinions, the ideas of the problems that may be occurring with people joining, with biologists joining professional societies. It was an internet-based survey. We surveyed 3,755 employees of Fish and Wildlife Service across all agencies and programs. We also had a 74% response rate, which according to Bruce and Cornell was one of the highest response rates they had received in any public or scientific survey. Other respondents for Fish and Wildlife Service, 69% said they were wildlife biologists. For USGS, we sent out the survey to 932 employees. Again, a very high response rate, 68%. 39% of the respondents said they were wildlife biologists. We followed it up with a non-respondent telephone survey to make sure that the people that didn't respond 
to the survey um, were not significantly different than those that did respond. And in the end, they were not. And so we felt that the results that I'll present here in a second are pretty characteristic and, and um, that you can stand on. So the first slide is agency support for professional activities, the employee perception. And I'm comparing here U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and U.S. Geological Survey. So you can see the check marks, and that is where employees felt like the agency supported them. So Fish and Wildlife Service employees felt like Fish and Wildlife Service supported collaborating with scientific studies, conducting scientific studies, reading scientific literature, and publishing government documents. However, those employees also felt the service did not support attending scientific meetings, presenting at scientific meetings, joining scientific societies, publishing in peer-reviewed journals, and organizing workshops. Other key findings is 50% of fish and wildlife biologists don't belong to any scientific society. 80% of fish and wildlife service biologists don't belong to the wildlife society. Participation by Fish and Wildlife Service biologists in scientific societies, including the Wildlife Society, was significantly less than U.S. Geological Survey. Also, Fish and Wildlife Service biologists do not perceive agency support to join, publish, attend, or present. What, was, what influenced membership by Fish and Wildlife Service biologists? Lack of motivation, journal cost, family responsibilities, supervisor and peer influences, and level of education. The youngest cohort, ages 19 to 25, had the lowest proportion of TWS members in Fish and Wildlife Service. The certification program, not perceived as relevant by either agencies. Journals, however, had a high level of satisfaction, greater than 70%, both with the Wildlife Society Bulletin and the Journal of Wildlife Management. So what do wildlife biologists want from the Wildlife Society? The increased emphasis, two areas. Increasing, increasing or being influencing natural resource policies and practical management issues in applied research. How about decreased emphasis? Game species management came out. So in summary, the lack of agency support limits involvement of U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service wildlife biologists in the Wildlife Society. So what were our recommendations based on our findings? For the Fish and Wildlife Service, Bruce and I thought the agency needs to promote a scientific culture for all biologists. Supervisors must instill, expect, and support scientific professionalism. We also must encourage advanced degrees. Again, level of education was related to other interest and engagement with scientific societies. Most importantly, the agency has to develop explicit guidance on participation in scientific societies, attendance at meetings, serving as a chapter president or treasurer, um, and other responsibilities. There has to be explicit guidance on those. What should the Wildlife Society turn around and do? Acknowledge management and research priorities of resource agencies, in this case, the Fish and Wildlife Service form our survey. Communicate accomplishments, natural resource policies, and continue publishing the Journal of Wildlife Management. Also determine and address the needs of entry-level biologists. Remember, it was the youngest age group that had the least amount of membership in the Wildlife Society. And finally, costs were brought up. So again, evaluate the cost of participation both in membership and journals and attendance at meetings. So in summary, what were the best parts of being the Alaska chapter president? No doubt influencing management and policy. The close relationship we had with Tom Franklin and headquarters in TWS, the letters that we wrote that were based on outstanding science and the volunteer by many people to contribute to those efforts. It was certainly a highlight for me. Another highlight, I really enjoyed meeting students and entry-level biologists and meeting new friends. The relevancy of the Wildlife Society resource agencies, supervisors must lead by example. If supervisors are not members of the Wildlife Society, attend professional meetings, publish or review articles and serving as editors, 
there's little emphasis for others to join. Emphasis on practical management issues and applied research. Things have to make a difference if you're going to do a study. TWS must influence natural resource policies, whether it's intensive management, whether it's a management decision in Northeast NPRA. The example here is a recent publication in 2019 by Ken Rosenberg and others that showed in my career from 1970 to 2010, there's been 3 billion birds that have been lost in that 50 year period. So common species like I grew up on the farm, bobwhite quail, eastern meadowlark, whippoorwills, blue jays, all have incurred a significant decline during that time period. So an example of where wildlife, the Wildlife Society can come to a play is ask the Fish and Wildlife Service what went wrong in those past 50 years and what can we do better? What can joint ventures, what can state agencies, what can refuges, what can non-governmental organizations do to prevent another 3 billion birds occurring in the next 50 years. I'll end with diversity and inclusion, something that probably many of us have to check a box. Did you take the course and therefore you acknowledge diversity and inclusion? I can tell you that the rural farm kid turned wildlife biologist model is no longer reality. Let's take a peek why. This graph shows the population in the United States from 1790 to 2010, the purple being urban, green being rural. If you look at 1990, 40% of people lived in urban areas, 60% were rural residents. Jump forward 110 years to 2010, 80% of the population in the United States are in urban settings and only 20% of the United States, people like me, had lived in a rural area. So in summary, diversity and inclusion. The United States is more racially and ethnically diverse today than it ever has been. So must the wildlife society and the wildlife profession. We must not only embrace and check the box, but we have to ensure that diversity and inclusion are absolutely mandated and actually occur in the wildlife society and the wildlife profession if we are to maintain our relevancy in conservation. Thank you. And I believe what is next are questions and discussions.